Hi, I'm Alexander Sergienko and today we're going to look at the term back pressure and its specific implementations in the Java ecosystem. But before we begin, don't forget to like this video and subscribe to my channel. Let's go! Back pressure is something that almost every programmer will likely encounter and for some it will become a common and major difficulty. The term back pressure is a software concept borrowed from physics. In a nutshell, back pressure is a resistance or force acting in the opposite direction of movement of the particles in some flow. This term can be altered in a programming context. Back pressure is the application's resistance to the intended data flow. The goal of each program is to take input data and transform it to a desired format. There is some resistance between the input and output when back pressure occurs. Most bottlenecks happen due to limitations in computing capacity. Data does not have enough time to process with the rising pace at which it arrives. Back pressure can also occur when an application is waiting for a user to respond to an event that is reasonably delayed. Back pressure is often not a phenomenon within itself, but rather a specific method of data processing. Let's look at the example of reading and writing a set of files. Writing a file usually takes much longer than reading. If your operating system, hard disk drive or SSD and programming libraries provide an effective reading speed of 150 megabytes per second and a writing speed of 100 megabytes per second, you should write an additional 50 megabytes to the buffer every second while reading a file and afterwards writing it back to the storage device. How to deal with it? The solution is simple. Read as much as you can write, not overwhelming the performance capacity. Almost all I.O. libraries in programming languages have a proper abstractions for dealing with such scenarios. But how to transfer the back pressure concept into interactions between two or more applications? The microservice architecture where each service can be deployed on a separate server is becoming increasingly popular. Back pressure in this case occurs when one server sends requests to another too quickly and the second application does not have enough time to process all of them at the current pace. Suppose that app A sends 100 requests per second to app B, but app B can handle only 75. There is a gap of 25 requests per second that remains unprocessed. So app B must somehow work with back pressure. One option is to buffer redundant requests, but if they come at the same rate, one day the server's free memory will run out. In some cases it's possible to ignore redundant requests, but usually it's prohibited by system requirements. In a perfect world app B would be able to control the flow of requests from app A, but this is not always achievable. For example, if app A generates requests on the user's behalf, we cannot tell the users to slow down, though it's sometimes necessary. So how do you work with back pressure? If you omit the option to increase server hardware capacity, there are only three options. Control the source or increase or decrease rates the receiver should decide what to do. Buffering temporarily storing requests that have not been processed on the fly, and ignore or skip processing of the redundant requests. Source control is definitely the best option. In the case of practical usage, the only possible overhead is the implementation of the back pressure mechanism itself. Unfortunately, this option is not always feasible. For example, the case with requests made on behalf of users is the most obvious and challenging one, because it's not so easy to control the user behavior. Buffering is usually chosen as the next solution, but it must be kept in mind that unlimited buffering is dangerous, as it leads to memory leaks and subsequent failures. 
it's often better to start ignoring requests than to continue to buffer them, taking away the memory from the server. Ignoring incoming requests is the least strategy that is often combined with buffering. To increase the buffer lifetime, it often ignores a fraction of the request each second. How do you deal with back pressure? Regardless of the programming language used, there are a few patterns that are commonly used with back pressure. The first one is pool. The consumer or recipient controls the source rates while using pool streams. Typically, it's a one-to-one -one option, that is, the request response mode, but there are alternative patterns for requests for n elements available, for example, flowables in Rx Java. The second one is push. In push streams, the source sends the message to the consumer to ask if the consumer is available and ready to process the next request. These streams are frequently used to process user actions. This pattern is implemented by numerous libraries, the most popular of which is Rx Java. The Spring ecosystem has a specific module named WebFlux. WebFlux uses the reactive stream specification to build non-blocking or asynchronous applications. A small number of threads here is enough for effective scaling, as opposed to the traditional approach such as servlets, wherein each HTTP request allocates a separate processing thread, a Tomcat server container is a good example of a synchronous web server. If a call to the database or other time-consuming I.O. is made during the request, the selected thread remains blocked until the request is finished. This is not great in terms of elasticity and resource utilization. In reactive applications, a request is treated as an event to be processed by the specific thread pool. If the request is dependent on I.O. or long-running remote calls, the processing thread does not wait for the result and continues to service other requests in the meanwhile. When an external service, which in this case is required to support asynchronous API, returns a response, a new event is generated that will be processed by the first available thread from the processing pool, and the result will be passed to the original HTTP request. To understand the WebFlux backpressure mechanism, we must first recall which transport protocol is used for the default interaction. Servers typically communicate with each other via TCP connections. TCP operates on bytes, but not application logic elements. Backpressure is typically used to control the number of logical objects received or sent over a network, and while TCP has its own flow control, it only works for bytes, not objects. TCP uses flow control to ensure that the sender does not overwhelm the consumer by sending packets faster than the consumer can process them. This is a back pressure in the context of the transport layer of the OSI model. The idea is that the consumer gives the sender notification on its current processing status. What happens when we send data via a network? The sender writes the data to the socket. The transport layer, in our case TCP, packs it into a segment and transfers it to the network layer. IP, which somehow delivers the packet to the recipient. On the receiving side, the network layer delivers this data to TCP level, making it available to the recipient. Well, TCP stores the data to send in a common sending buffer, and the data to retrieve is stored in a shared receiving buffer. When the consumer application is ready, it reads the data from the receiving buffer. That's how control works in TCP networks. WebFlux backpressure is currently governed by the underlying transfer protocol and does not reflect the recipient's actual state. The diagram shows the interaction between the two microservices where the left one sends data streams and the right one consumes them. WebFlux takes care of transforming objects into bytes and back for further transmission via TCP. Here starts long-term processing of the element which requests the next element at the end. At this point, WebFlux holds the bytes coming over the network without sending ECK, 
because the business logic of receiving microservice is busy processing the previous request. Because of the nature of TCP flow control, a left microservice can still send data to the network. As you can see from the diagram, the demand of the consumer is different from the demand in the producer. Demand is measured in logical objects. This means that their demands are isolated and the mechanism only works if Webflux interacts with the business layer of the application. That is, Webflux back pressure control is not as fair as we anticipated. How to handle HTTP requests? Back pressure metadata is not sent via HTTP. This protocol simply does not support such a feature, so it's back to CCP flow control and sending and receiving buffers. Producer and consumer depends in reactive streams also rely on TCP flow control. Plain Spring MVC implies that applications block the current thread, for example, to perform remote or time-consuming calls. That's why Solid continues use relatively large thread pools to smooth out the effects of blocking. And again, Tomcat would be a nice reference. Webflux and other non-blocking frameworks use small thread pools of fixed size, so-called event lab workers. Let's take a look at Webflux thread model. In a Webflux service, you can find the following threads. On the vanilla Spring Webflux, there is one thread for the server needs and several threads for processing incoming requests, usually equals to the number of processor cores available to the source. The reactive web client runs in event loop mode. Reactor provides abstractions of thread pools called schedulers. The publish on method is used to schedule or switch processing to another thread pool. Schedules are named according to the processing strategy. For example, parallel is used for CPU-oriented parallel processing with a limited number of threads, and elastic in turn for I.O. with a large number of threads. Under the hood, Webflux relies on Reactor Netty, a backpressure wrapper of a Netty web server. Reactor Netty creates runtime get runtime available processes doubled threads for use in internal event loop thread pool. If an incoming request results in a blocking remote call, it must be properly wrapped so that the current thread can return to the immense thread pool to handle other incoming requests. For heavy computing applications, it makes sense to use a dedicated thread pool. This ensures that event loop will only receive and send data over the network without wasting resources on other possibly blocking operations. Let us summarize. Big pressure is crucial in every distributed application. It's a mechanism rather than a problem to be solved. There are numerous big pressure strategies available as well as reference implementations. If you wish to use back pressure in your application, Spring Webflux is a great pick to start. Thank you for watching. I hope you found this video useful. Like the video and subscribe to my channel. Bye, have a fantastic day.